I don't know what most white people in this country feel. I can only include what they feel from the state of their institutions. Now, this is the evidence. You want me to make an act of faith, risking myself, my wife, my woman, my sister, my children, on some idealism which you assure me exists in America, which I have never seen. Karen, before we have the listeners hear this next episode, we just finished the episode filming or recording it, and it is dynamic. Like, it is... How you feeling? (laughs) So I said something after we stopped recording that I think I'll say here is in this episode, we don't completely agree on some of the perspectives, which I think adds so much value because usually when we interview people, we kind of see eye to eye on most of our, like the worldviews are so aligned that we're just kind of talking the information, but from the same perspective. But this interview uh, that our guest who we'll introduce in a moment, he comes from a different perspective. But in that interplay of the conversation, I think that there is a lot that we can pick up on and sharpen, like come to a, a understanding of both perspectives yeah. that actually leads to like a higher understanding of how, of what's going on, what the dynamics are. And so I think there's a lot of value and I think it was a really interesting conversation. And speaking with Dr. Rogers, our guest that you guys are going to hear up next. He just reminds me of so many of my elders. One thing you have to understand is that black people are not a monolith. And there are so many different conversations that we have not under the white gaze. So a lot of the things that he was saying are not unfamiliar to me, but it it was just really an interesting conversation. And I have so much respect for him, even though I respectfully disagree on many points. But I think it's still just a helpful convo in a peep into the lives of black people as we wrestle with these structures, these systems. Yeah. So we're excited for you guys to hear it. Yep. So we are honored to have a very special guest today, Mr. James O. Rogers, who has informed me to call him Jim. And so he is known as the diversity coach and he has a book by the same name and We want to hear, first of all, before we hear about you being the diversity coach, we like to know specifically for our African-American guests, because you're more than what you do. We want to know who is James O. Rogers. Welcome, first of all. And who is James O. Rogers? Thank you. And thank you for the question. Well, I'm Deacon Rogers' son, Rachel Rogers' son. Wife of Sharon, father of five children, grandfather of 13, former corporate executive in the old telecom industry. For the last 30 years, 30 plus years, I've been a professional service provider as a consultant, executive coach, speaker, and process developer. I'm known as a diversity coach because I, for the last 30 years, have been recognized as a thought leader in the field of diversity management. In fact, that's a language that I actually introduced to the field. Wow. I'm also a, a acknowledged disciple of the work of Dr. Roosevelt Thomas, who is the father of the diversity movement. Unfortunately, we lost him several mm-hmm. years ago. So part of what I do now is try to continue his legacy of helping organizations understand that diversity is not a sociology project. It is a business enterprise mm-hmm. performance project. A graduate of Howard University, undergrad in double E. I have an MBA from University of Alabama and also a PhD in management. Awesome. And I'm really trying to now reintroduce the concept of diversity management because there's so much misinformation and disinformation out in the world about the whole diversity and inclusion movement. It's become more divisive. So that's what I'm trying to do is help people understand that it does have value. That is amazing. Wow. That's who you are. And that is awesome. And you're a Howard graduate. Come on. I'm not. But I love when they say (laughs) H.U. You know, I love that. Yes, I love that. (laughs) That is so awesome. Well, I want to hear more about the language that you built around and just the thought processes that you've introduced 
and the work that you've done with many corporations. I'm looking at the list. I mean, I see AT&T, I see various universities, hospitals, insurance companies, manufacturers. I mean, just this long list of companies that you've and organizations that you've worked with. When you first step into a space or when you're introduced to an organization or university or a major company, what are the first steps in them onboarding you to teach them about diversity and inclusion? Well, first of all, being a thought leader, I generally work with the C-suite, usually with the CEO and his Mm -hmm. staff. And my intent is really to help them understand a more sophisticated view of diversity. My mentor, I didn't realize this until the last couple of years, but as prominent as Dr. Roosevelt Thomas was in the diversity field and as many CEOs as he knew personally who endorsed his work, He still ran into this idea that because he is a brown skinned man, he people assumed that the diversity work that he was doing was all about black Mm -hmm. issues. It never occurred to me that that would be the case. But part of what I'm trying to do is disabuse them of the idea that this is social work. In fact, this work began when we recognized that there was going to be a massive demographic and psychographic shift in the marketplace and in the workplace. What that means by what I mean by that is the Hudson Institute study back in 1986 or 85, 86 said that the majority of new entrants to our workforce would be what I call Mm non-traditional people. Now, that's just a fact of life. That's not something that, you know, you need to be fearful of. It's just something you need to be prepared Mm -hmm. for. So with that fact of life, several people came up with, okay, what do we do about this? Dr. Thomas came up with a great answer. We need to prepare ourselves to learn to manage people of diverse types, teams of diverse composition. And we needed to make sure that frontline managers, middle managers, and executives got comfortable with the idea that they would not be managing the same types of people over and over again. So... It was a simple idea. It was a simple solution. But because the word diversity got to be so popular with corporate America and those are the people with the money, a lot of other people with different agendas latched on to the word diversity and inclusion and started promoting their ideas. Their ideas are great, but we ought to call them what they are. Diversity and inclusion is not a civil rights issue. It's not affirmative action. It is not gender equity. It is not racial equality. It is not LGBT rights. It is about an enterprise recognizing that whether they like it or not, the world is becoming more diverse. And if you're going to run an enterprise and run it successfully to get world class results, you have to develop the skills and the attitudes so that you can recognize the talent that you have and to utilize that talent in such a way that you continue to get world-class results. That's the simple proposition of diversity management. Unfortunately, the word diversity gets used for all kinds of other issues, and that creates confusion. So part of what I do when I'm talking to the senior team is try to remove the confusion. Guys, this is the simple Uh, And it's mostly guys, unfortunately. (laughs) Guys, this is the simple proposition that we're offering you. If you add anything to it, it's going to create more confusion. And confused mind does nothing. So the reason that there has been so little action on diversity management is because everybody hears the word diversity and they make up their own meaning of what it is. And so nobody really knows what it is. And so they're confused. And what happens when you're confused You don't take action. So part of my, we call it executive education, when I'm working with the senior team, is to get them out of the mode of reacting with their feelings and get them to think like businessmen. This is a fact of life. Just like the Fed just announced a new rate increase recently. If you're a business person, that's a fact of life. There's nothing you can do about that. But now you have to include that in your business planning. Well, the advent of increasing diversity is a fact of life. 
There's nothing you can do about that. But now you have to include that in your planning about how you manage your enterprise. Mm-hmm. And so that's really what we're trying to do is simple, logical, straightforward, practical. But because it's gotten the language has gotten co-opted by so many other movements, it's been difficult for people to hear that truth through all the noise in the marketplace. So this is my attempt to kind of write the ship, if you will. And that's why the latest book that I've written is intended to kind of help people move back to the real intent so that we can actually um, do some good work. I mean, listening to everything that you said, I'm a little confused, actually, because, of course, I think of diversity inclusion like most people would think of it. And you're saying that it's different. So when you're dealing with individuals who come to the table, probably the majority of white males in corporations, and they come with implicit biases, sometimes microaggressive behaviors, racism, gender bias, just anything that people who are of the majority culture tend to do just based on their privileges of not having to see anyone that is other than them. How do those things not correlate to the idea of of diversity inclusion when you have to undo those things in the minds of people or basically work to undo those things in the mind of people who bring those to the table? So there's a faulty assumption there, and that's part of what I'm trying to correct. This is not about fixing white men. White men are no different than you or me or anyone Mm -hmm. else. They have their own differences. They have their own similarities. They have their own thoughts and feelings. But so do Mm -hmm. I. When it comes to bias, prejudice, stereotypes, and a head full of reactions to Mm -hmm. differences, we're all the same. That's part of what we teach in our learning experiences is that this is about human connection. This is not about white men versus the rest Mm -hmm. of the world. As long as we position it that way and white men feel that they are the enemy, they're the ones that need to be fixed. That is why for the last 30 years, we've made no Mm -hmm. progress. I wrote an article back in 1996 called What About Bob? Because I heard my colleagues in the diversity field going down the path of demonizing white Mm -hmm. men as though they were the Mm -hmm. problem. And I said, well, you know, if we don't include white, heterosexual, non-Hispanic, able-bodied men in this conversation as full partners, we will not make any progress. Mm -hmm. Because if you demonize any group of people, they have but one human reaction. They're going to get even. I mean, this guy showed up in the corporation just by accident of birth. He happens to have fair skin. And all of a sudden, he's being made to feel like he's the enemy. Human nature tells me he's not going to react well Mm -hmm. to that. So what I'm talking about, people, and I know people feel strongly about racial equality and gender equity. And one of the things that I rely on, and I say to senior teams all the time, Mark Twain once said, we all do no end to feeling, but we mistake it for thinking. Mm -hmm. Diversity management is about thinking about how to get world class results, given a new reality that we're going to have more and more diversity in the marketplace and in the workplace. Simple proposition. When we overlay it with all of this complexity about microaggressions and when we say microaggressions, we assume what white people do to to women and to people of color. That's not fair. Because, see, I do it, too. Mm -hmm. Whatever microaggressions that are in my head through my condition is I do it, too. So I can't point to someone else and say, you need to get fixed. What I have to do is focus on myself and recognize I get trapped into the same things that other people do. So let me fix me. Let me work on me. And then maybe by example, I can show other people the value. Mm -hmm. And it's the only only reason people change habits or change behavior is that they see value in a new way of doing things. So I just really offer them, here's a better way of doing it. You get better results. Your life will be better when you relate to people who are not necessarily like you and you can get them on your team and they can supervise you and they can lead you and you can lead them back. That's what we're looking for. Leveling the playing field, but leveling the playing field means that we all 
have to be on the level playing field. We can't diminish one group specifically and say, see, here's the thing. We use the word inclusion all the time, but we're practicing inclusion by deliberately excluding a whole group of people. Mm -hmm. Now that just as an engineer by background and as a logical MBA and business analyst, that just doesn't make sense to me. So as I walk back myself away from my feelings about this as a black man raised in America, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with all of this stuff that goes with that. But what I'm inviting people to do is let's not look at the past. Let's look at what we've got now. What we want to do is collectively let's move ahead and see if we can not create a productive, comfortable, relationship based enterprise platform that works for everybody. And that's the key. When diversity and inclusion doesn't work for everybody, it is doomed to failure. That's just a fact. So a couple of questions and I'm, I'm hearing you. What I think I hear you saying is that you're removing the emotion from the process and bringing everyone to the table with a blank slate and helping to just reverse the ideologies from many people that with whatever biases they may bring to the table. And of course, there's historical context, right, that brings those ideologies into play. But from a corporate structure, you're basically stepping into a space where you're making it more inclusive of everyone so that everyone can engage. Is that what I understand you to say? You have heard it correctly. Okay. It is about everyone. Mm -hmm. so here's some facts that, you know, when we think this stuff becomes obvious, when we feel it's not mm -hmm. so obvious. We use blanket statements like white mm -hmm. men. There is no blanket white men. One tenth of one percent of white men run most of this country's institutions. That's one tenth of one percent of white men. What about the other 99 percent? They're struggling just like the rest of us. Now, I know this because as a corporate executive, I was a fast track corporate executive. I've made it to the top as very, very quickly. I left and decided to share what I'm what I had learned with others who were equally disposed towards that type of career path. Mm -hmm. And what I will tell you, and I told someone this the other day, I have a lot of black friends mm -hmm. in corporate America and most of them have C in the front of their title. So I cannot say that you being black is an impediment to you making it to the top of the house. What in, the impediment to getting, you getting to the top of the house is your own thinking that someone is trying to block you. Corporate executive leadership is a game. We've been teaching this for years. Even before diversity came along, we were teaching it. Jeff Howard and Harvey Coleman were teaching people, this is a game. And if you learn the rules and master the rules, you can win. The rules are not set up to disadvantage you because of your brown skin. It's to disadvantage you because you don't understand the rules. You cannot play baseball with basketball rules and expect to win. Mm -hmm. And so what we my efforts have been is going back to that old model of saying, OK, there is a dearth of people of color in leadership. And the only reason that exists yeah, I wrote this article that says, why are there so few black CEOs? And it boils down to this one mm -hmm. statement. Black people are reluctant to develop strong, productive relationships with white people. Mm -hmm. For some reason, we have been conditioned to believe, and this is a classic statement. I know you're not going to like this, but, you know, I've been doing this mm -hmm. for 40 years, so I've mm -hmm. heard all this stuff. There's a strong belief. I have to work with them all day. I'm certainly not going to go and play with them. So the fact is, if you decide not to go to that after hours function, if you decide not to go out on the golf course, whether you can play or not, if you decide if you're not going to the company picnic, you have made a choice. I don't want to play. I don't want to win. I'm really OK with just being a utility player. So here's where thinking comes in. We look at the fact that there's not as many people of color and women in key positions that as we would, per, would would hope there would be. And our immediate reaction is my feelings kick in and we say that's got to be because of discrimination 
microaggressions and all of this other stuff that we talk mm-hmm. about. But why don't we think our way through it and say, what could possibly be the cause of that? See, one of the things we have to understand is that when there is a process where there are a set of rules, the rules will not change just because there are new players. Mm-hmm. So when Jackie Robinson broke into baseball, they didn't change the rules of baseball. Jackie had to understand, here's how you play the game. Now, good for him. (laughs) He had good grounding and he already knew how to play the game. So all he did is showed up and played the hell out of it. And that's what broke it open. The same thing is true in corporate America. There's a game. Here's a set of rules. You master the game. You master the rules. You can win. And I know a lot of people looking from the outside say that just can't be true. Well, I'm telling you from 40 years of experience with corporate America, it is true. I have never seen a case where I have instructed someone how to play the game and had them master it that they didn't win. Okay, so I'll use myself for example. I mean, I do this podcast with two white men. I'm an African-American woman. I work in executive management and have worked in that field for almost 20 something years. I'm 50 years old. So 22 years specifically in the area that I work in. I'm in the top my field. Like I am the highest position that you can get in. Most of the people that I work that work under me are going to be white women. I for many years have been almost the most of the time the only black woman. I mean, when I approach the hiring and management, I literally do it based on credentials. However, every day that I walk into my space and my boss, my my boss, I'm the boss under him. He is a white Irish Catholic man. I have had to deal with microaggression. I have had to deal with racism from the consumers. They come in with all kinds of things. They tell my staff things having never met me. Most of the time I'm in the background. I'm the one who empowers and equips my staff so that they can do what they do. But I'm most of the time behind the scenes. And even though I work in a small organization, I run my office like a corporate structure. I have to battle specifically white women a lot with how they come to the table and they think and assume that I'm not going to operate in excellence because I'm black. I've heard the N word thrown around because like directed at me. I've had people say, well, just from seeing me and not even interacting with me, I see this colored woman walking through the space. Who is she? Oh, she's the boss. How did she get in that position? My boss has to kick (laughs) people out. And this on Every day, every week, we are dealing with some type of microaggressive behavior, whether it's towards the women in my staff, sexual inappropriate, just all kinds of things, or directed at me just from seeing me exist. And again, I work with white people, mostly white people. Sometimes I'm the only black person in space. I go to the functions. I interact with, I have my own companies. I have two companies where I manage clients all over the country. I have clients and I'm just using myself as a case study. I manage clients in Colorado, Michigan, Salem, Oregon, Maryland, San Diego. I have clients everywhere and I have two businesses. Most of the people that I work with are white people, but I still, and my husband is a police officer, has been in law enforcement for 30 plus years. We've been pulled over in our own neighborhood, asked why we are there. Um, My husband comes home with stories of how he is treated as a black officer in a community that is mostly white. How do you, I, I completely understand and respect what you are saying because I get what you are doing. And I believe that your work is so important because you're leveling the playing field. And I do believe for the work that you're doing, it's amazing. But how do you dismiss or disregard all of the things that brought us to the place where we need diversity and inclusion in the first place? And how do you not like with historical context, it's not necessarily to make white people feel bad. It's just what history is. And if we weren't talking in the context, if we were talking about history 2000 years ago with people that nobody, you know, nobody has any real connection to, 
like my great grandmother, her father was enslaved. So I have like this connection. And she died when I was 20. I have a somewhat of a connection to slavery because my great great, my great great grandmother. I'm sorry. But like if we were talking about people 2000 years ago and whatever the history was, it just was that. Right. It's just what it is. How do we disregard a complete history? And I know I probably have presented a loaded question and comments. Yeah, but but it's, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very common, it's a very common, and that's exactly what I'm trying to get people yes. beyond. You just described your situation, mm-hmm. and my reaction is, so what are you trying to tell me? That you're human and that you run into other human beings and they behave in human ways. If you were to talk to your Irish Catholic uh, boss and ask him a little bit about his history, I was just watching this the other day, he'll probably tell you how his grandfather faced situations where he'd be looking for a job and there would be a statement on the application on the application says no Irish need apply. I mean, that's fact. That's right. history. And you have to decide they had the, the Irish had to decide. You know, what are we going to do with this? Are we going to sit around and carp about it? Or are we just going to play the game so well that we overcome it? And that's what I'm inviting people of color and women and the new immigrants and people. This is America. This is how we roll. When you first come in, you are down. Mm -hmm. I don't care who you are, what you look like, you are down. You have to work your way up to the place where you can command the respect that you are due based on your contribution. Mm -hmm. Not because you are crusading for one thing versus another. We don't have to diminish history. One of the things that I have to tell Mm -hmm. people is all the things that we're talking about under the banner of diversity and inclusion. I, for one, am a scholar. I love Mm -hmm. that stuff. Man, that's fascinating Mm -hmm. to me. But it's not to everyone. And people who are not interested in it, you know, don't want you forcing them to learn something they don't want to learn. That's part of part of what we do in my book is talk about adult learning theories. Adults learn what they want to learn, not what you want to Mm -hmm. teach them. They learn what they Mm want to learn. So, yeah, make that available. Don't put it under the label of diversity and inclusion. But if you want to teach anti-racism, put it out there. And there's going to be a whole bunch of people who have intellectual curiosity and want Mm -hmm. to know about that Mm -hmm. stuff. If you want to teach microaggressions, there's a whole bunch of people who have intellectual curiosity and want to know about that stuff. But there's a whole bunch of other people who could care less. And what I'm saying is don't force people to learn what they don't want to Mm -hmm. learn, because you know what? They're not going to learn it anyway. You can teach all you want. You can instruct all you want. But adults learn what they want to learn. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you wind up doing more harm than good by trying to force an agenda force some information on people who are not quite ready to receive it. All because you think you're right. And that comes from Mm -hmm. feeling. When you feel like you're right, you believe here's what everybody needs to know. Well, one of the things that I learned in doing this work intensely with all kinds Mm -hmm. of people is people know what they know and they don't know what they Mm -hmm. don't know. And no one has an obligation to know what you think they ought to know. People are living their lives. They're all we're all trying to make it and putting in front of them an agenda that doesn't match their life journey. It's just counterproductive. So what I'm saying is I hear your story. It is not not unlike my story. The difference is when people came at me with microaggressions, you know what I said? I'm going to put that down as something that I can play the game even better with them. There's a weakness. There's a weakness on their part. So you remember competition. So people use whatever they can use in Mm -hmm. competition to Mm -hmm. win. And when I was in the corporate America, I had a couple of colleagues who used my race as part of their competitive advantage. They thought, you know what I did? I turned it around Mm -hmm. on them because I wanted to win. I didn't want to be a victim. I didn't want to be, oh, poor me. Look at how they're talking about me because everybody gets talked Mm -hmm. about. And it's a matter of whether or not you allow that to trigger you into underperforming or whether you allow it to, what I'd say, assume no malicious intent. People are just being Mm -hmm. people. You look at the history of America, we've called everybody some of Mm -hmm. everything. N-word is not, it's not something new. We've called people kikes and chinks and whatever you you can think of. All derogatory terms, but it's all part of the competition for being 
fully American. Hey guys, it's Garen. Before we jump in, I wanted to let you know about another little project that we have. Uh, a lot of our audience is coming from a Christian perspective. And whether that's you or not, uh, you may be interested in trying to get a better understanding of what the Bible says and teaches. We have a lot of American filters that the Bible has been passed through. As it's been read and understood for so long in the American context, we can lose sight of what it actually meant to the original audience. And so that's something we're trying to recover and explore. So we started a new podcast called Bible Words, where we look at different biblical terms like justice, the nations, or even how the Bible addresses slavery. The episodes are short, and the first couple are already live, so you can check out Bible Words wherever you listen to podcasts. Well, I'm just going to insert one more thing. So I've never allowed any of those things to stop me, obviously, if I'm the top in my field. Um, and I continue to make businesses and teach my children how to, my husband and I, we teach them how to build wealth. So I'm not playing the victim as much as I'm saying that even though I'm playing the game, those things still do exist and they don't, they don't go away. I feel like history plays a part in where many people who are minorities in some kind of capacity in this present day, that history affects that. I, again, completely respect and understand exactly where your niche is. A person's desire to learn or not learn something does not eliminate the historical context. And it's not a pissing match in that, say, for example, my Irish Catholic boss versus the black experience. But the truth is like history and truth or history and truth is what I would just offer to this conversation in respect of, again, what you're presenting. I completely understand, but I just have to gently push and respectfully push back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And feel free to push yeah. back. I'm usually right, but <laughs> okay. you know, I like to push okay. back. <laughs> <laughs> no, so here's, here's, here's okay. the thing. We have spent 30 years in the diversity mm-hmm. movement trying to get people to change their bias, their mm-hmm. prejudice, their head full of stereotypes and their reactions to mm-hmm. difference. You know how much progress we've made? Zero would be a good mm-hmm. answer. And the reason is we haven't thought through how humans respond to mm-hmm. stuff. See, we have been forcing information on them. You've got to know my history. Well, I don't really have to if I don't want to. But if you present it to me in a way that says, here's something that would be of value to you, that will help you in your Mm -hmm. life. If you understood this, it would help you to propel yourself to a higher position. Mm -hmm. Then they're interested. But just because you and people who look like you have some unfortunate things in their historical baggage is not of interest to a lot of people. That's just a fact. I'm just telling you, for 30 years, we've been coming up with topic after topic. Cross-cultural communications, pluralism, multiculturalism, blah, 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 et cetera. Mm-hmm. All of it was intended to try to help some people understand things that they didn't understand. And guess what? They still don't understand them and they still don't have an interest in understanding them. What we have to do and what I've learned and what all of my C-suite friends have learned is the rules are the rules of the game. The game will not change because they're different players. Everybody has to disregard some type of microaggression in their career and in their Mm -hmm. life. Let's not make it about being a woman or being gay or being black. It is just part of the game. Play the game and win. So I have a bunch of swirling thoughts that I want to like express and I don't exactly know how to tie them all together. But I guess part of what I'm seeing play out and tell me if this is like the dynamics is so I think we can agree that the game is not fair like you already referenced yourself how at the highest level it's mostly white men who are in those 0.01 percent of the top leadership positions of institutions and then i think we agree that people have this dignity where they are all regardless of race and background capable of the same kind of excellence and so part of what you are trying to drive is helping these executives see that they can unlock all kinds of potential for success for their organizations by including diversity and removing, like inclusion is actually a path forward to 
success for the company, for the organization. And you referenced the rules of the game. And I think that one of the rules of the game right now is that basically in that C-suite, they don't want this push towards diversity and inclusion that's coming from a place of addressing past injustice. And so I think it basically is a rule of the game that you have to take the approach that you're taking, regardless of whether you even wanted to, because as soon as you start bringing in language of like, I mean, we are a history podcast, so we right. look extensively at the past, and the past has been yeah. brutally unfair. And even the reference to Irish Catholics, it's like, well, the Irish did go through racism, um, but nothing like what Black Americans went through. They weren't enslaved, and they were invited into the privileges of whiteness. They could attend the public facilities that Black people couldn't were, were barred from for generations and were invited into and had access to higher education generations earlier. So it's, there's parallels, but it's not the same. It's not a level playing field. But I think what I see you trying to do is because you're looking forward to the future, you're saying like, well, how do we actually make progress? Because if we just come and say, hey, you are being unfair, you're being unfair. The reaction of C-suite white powerful people is like defensiveness, just like any human's reaction would be defensiveness if they feel like they're getting attacked. And that defensiveness locks the game in the place that it's in. And so you're trying to think pragmatically about how do we actually make progress for the future? Is all of that a fair characterization? It is, absolutely. It's about being practical and moving beyond being right to being effective. I hear a lot of people that I talk to, they are absolutely right about it. The history has been awful. And I tell people we get caught in this trap of, oh, ain't it awful? So we want to just talk about all the things, all the bad things that have happened. Oh, ain't it awful? So let's just say right up front. Yeah, that's awful. Now, what are we going to do? This is the engineer in me. I'm a problem Mm -hmm. solver. So I look at things from the standpoint, here are the facts before us. Here's what we know. Here's what we're trying to get to. How do we get there? And what I'm suggesting to people is if we go back to the idea, see, again, and I'm looking at my own history. When women tell me how awful it is for them to be in a female body and trying to make it to the top of the house. I asked them, how has that affected you personally? Can you give me a specific example of where you believe you have been limited simply because you were in in female body and you were playing the game well? And playing the game, by the way, means having the right connections, having the right relationships, being seen in the right way, performing, yes, but not necessarily being the best performer. The best performer never makes it to the top of the house. It's the person who has the right connections and the right relationships who makes it to the top of the house. Those are the rules that people just need to know. If they don't know those, they will be playing the performance game and they will be losing and they will start making up reasons why I'm losing. And those reasons won't have anything to do with why they're not achieving what they set out to achieve. So I'm just saying if we put on our thinking caps, we can have there's a better, more pragmatic, more practical, more effective and sustainable way of doing this work. As a spiritual teacher, I'll tell you this one thing that I have learned. An ancient wisdom teacher said, seek ye first the higher goal, and all this other stuff will be added with it. So what I say is seek ye first effective relationships that get you what you want in organizations, and what you will get is better recruitment of a variety of people, more retention, more representation, and a better reputation. All of that will come with it, but it starts with you seeking to teach people, here's how the game is played. Here's how you win. You get to choose whether or not you want to play by these rules or not. If you choose not to, God bless you. That's your choice. But don't quarrel about the fact that you didn't make it to the top because you chose not to play the game according to the game's rules. So I think the potential weakness that I I see in that, and I think that I think from within your framework, that all makes sense. But I think the potential weakness I see is so, you know, in reference to, you know, C-level black executives. So there are black men who have not been barred from C-level leadership by their race, obviously. And by playing the game, they've been able to rise to that level, which is a proof of case that they can, that the current system does not bar them from that level. But part of how they've had to reach that level is by playing the game. 
And the game is itself, I think, created by and for white men. So part of the game... That's not true. If those black men were authentically living out their own cultural representation, if they were being honest about and talking about their family history in an unbridled way that wasn't like kind of tiptoeing on the feelings of the white men so that the white men didn't feel accused or attacked by what they were saying, if those men decided to play basketball rather than golf because they just relate to it culturally from their childhood versus these white level C guys that they're with are relating to their own cultural upbringing, which was golf because they probably grew up in families that played golf. Like they, they have to play the game, but the game itself is a game that is more culturally native to white C level family, inherited wealth legacy families than it is black families that grew up without access to a lot of those same places and resources. So it's, it's through assimilation and adapting, like adapting to the white cultural expressions that the gain, that the top of the pyramid becomes accessible. And so race does not bar someone, but it still is a cultural favoritism in a sense that if a black yeah. man is willing to basically assimilate to essentially white culture, then he has access. But that itself is not really a fair system, like really a, a truly fair multicultural society would actually get to the point where it can actually value the variety of cultural expressions and play games other than just golf and not have these like certain norms and expectations that are historically white that are almost like shibboleths or barriers to entry for people who aren't willing to kind of step through this barrier. What I would contribute is the emotional labor. I can play as an executive any game because that's what you get taught to code switch. As an African-American woman, you have to play the game. I worked for a black attorney who worked for Clarence Thomas at one point in his career. And he used to say, Katina, we have to save the race and we have to play the game. And I learned very early growing up in Memphis how to play the game. (laughs) But the emotional labor is still very real. And yes, I don't think that white people have to go home and deal with the emotional labor of being in corporations and playing the game in a way that a black woman who's still going to play the game has to carry. And we see that in healthcare disparities. And we see that in ways that, you know, black people are more susceptible and have more issues with mental health and various, I mean, the black woman's maternal mortality rate, infant mortality rate. We see these things still play out. Playing the game, I would say, still comes at a cost. And that cost can be very emotionally dangerous as well as the impact that it leaves on the next generation. But I do understand and agree, like it's a weird space to be in because I understand that what you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Rogers, diversity and inclusion should be a functionality in corporate structure and not necessarily a change of heart, but a more of a functionality to produce the diversity inclusion and, and the concept that all money is green. And so if I'm appealing to a corporate exec, all money is green, you're going to basically use human capital to your advantage. And, in, and if you're going to do that, these are the rules that are not so much focused on a person's feeling and experience, but focused on production. Is that, I know we've probably thrown a lot at, at you, but I know you got this. <laughs> hey, you're not throwing anything at that that I haven't heard right. before. And they're all good feelings to have, right. but they're not very thoughtful. Okay. So what I want to suggest to you is that when we use language like white people have privilege and white people are at the top of the house, that's just untrue. Like I started this conversation, you're talking about one tenth of one percent of white people. The people at the top, those are the ones with the power. And traditionally, people with that power have looked that way. But see, if you're observant, if you pay attention, if you get beyond your grievances and start looking at how to be effective and sustainable, you will notice that there is a growing body of white women in the C-suite. There is a growing body of East Indian men heading up tech companies. And how did they get there? They didn't get there because they showed up 
with their brown skin and said, you owe me a CEO job. They got there because they played the game according to the rules. They learned it according to the English system that they grew up in in India, and they survived it. They made it. Now, I want to make this statement just because I have the role that I play as a consultant. Mm -hmm. I speak with all people. Mm -hmm. In the classroom, I create a safe environment for people to tell me how they're really feeling. And I've had so many white men come to me and tell me this idea of my privilege is I may be privileged, but I ain't feeling it. I don't feel it. All I know is I came into this job. My father was a laborer. I grew up in Appalachia. I don't feel like I'm part of the mainstream. All these things that they're blaming me for, I just, I don't feel it. So we have to get out of this idea of putting all white people into one basket and saying they are the power structure because they are not. The people in power are the people in power, and they come in a variety of different colors and different genders, etc. What we're arguing against, we're not using our brains, we're arguing against what used to be. We have to look at what is, and we have to look at it on an individual basis. Garen, why aren't you the boss? I mean, you look at it that way. You're a white male. Why aren't you the boss? If you have all this privilege, why aren't you the top of the house? The fact is, other people have made it their you haven't. And that's the part of the story that I want people to pay attention to. Everybody's story matters. This is not about black people and women telling their stories so that you can feel bad for them. It's about all of us telling our stories because it has depth, it has meaning, and it helps inform all of us about how we stop griping and how we make progress. Start from where we are. What do we need to do to build successful enterprises? What are the resources that we need? Who are the people we need on our team? How do we un overcome the artificial barriers to those relationships that allow us to build teams that produce results? Again, this is a simple formulation. The more complexity we add to it, the less likely we are going to make progress. Well, when we talk about whiteness as a construct, it was a construct <clears throat> that was not created by black people. White, the word white man came from white people. It did not come from black people. Black people didn't create that terminology and they didn't create that structure. And yes, but we adopted it. Well, it, yeah, we, well, we adopted, adopted it, it and it's still a power structure that is at play today. But also, white men is not, white people is not a power well, structure. Also, I think it's like white people. The, like the game, you've talked about the game as if the game is just something that exists, but the game is not just like an, a thing that we can't evaluate, a thing that exists on its own apart from humans that create the game. And the, the game is created. It's a cultural creation of the people who it are is. at the top. Right. And so the people historically at yeah. the top, having been mostly white people, it is like the game itself. I think that maybe the difference is you're looking more at a pr pragmatic view of how do we move forward. Right. And what we're saying is that the game itself is not the way that it should be. But Garen, how do you change the game? The game is played by playing it so well that you get to the top. The people at the top have the power to change the mm -hmm. rules. No one else does. So the only way that you change the rules is getting to the top. You can't change the rules by saying, oh, these are some awful rules. They ought to change them because they are not going to change them for one reason. It's working for them. Yeah. So my black C-suite friends, they don't we don't have this conversation about this stuff. We need to change the rules of the game. No, game the rules are working for me. So uh, we have to be pragmatic about this. Frederick Douglass says years ago, power seeds nothing. Power gives up nothing without a fight. So in order to win this game, of, uh, I know that you're, you feel righteous about knowing that the rules are not fair to everybody. Everybody knows life is not fair. So let's just accept that as a fact of life. But if you're going to change the rules, you got to play the game so well that you get to the top and say, you know something, I think there's a better way of doing this. Come, let us reason together. Until you get to the top, you don't have the power or the capacity or even the right to mess with the rules. You just don't. That's the pragmatic. That's the pragmatic part. I perceive that you are a Christian man with some of the scriptures that you are shared. And we are all Christians here. 
And I would say that as I've worked in in his executive management, I have managed many white women who have come from poverty. And in my space where I lead, I have the opportunity to steward and foster relationship and bridge a gap in my small world with white women and black women. And so when we come to the table, we share experiences. We're reading through a book that talks about trauma and some of that trauma is intergenerational. It's based on the trauma of Vietnam veterans, I think, but it talks about the trauma, just the idea of trauma and how it plays out. And so even though I have an experience as an African-American woman and there's a history that I have, I do understand that there's a history and how the construct of whiteness that I didn't create, I didn't make up the word, how it also impacted poor white people. Because the history is just the history. It's not an indictment against the person standing in front of me. The history is just what it is that brings us all to where we are. And there are disadvantages to being a poor white person in America. That disadvantage does not have anything to do with their color. That disadvantage has exploited their whiteness to make them feel that they are above other races by making them, giving them oversight. And that's just history. But I make a connection with white women based on some of our shared experiences where my parents pick cotton, their parents pick cotton. And that's just the truth of, of the, and they use our houses, my parents, and I use our house. And so I take advantage of those moments of shared experiences, which I think is what some of the work that you're trying to do, again, just making leveling that playing field. And especially with you being a graduate of an African-American college, and we know why those colleges were created. I have such a value for HBCU graduates because we're not a monolith. We all bring so many different things to the table. And I think your niche is really necessary. And I think that it's a powerful concept I do disagree with some points, but I definitely can see where it's beneficial. And that's all I have to share. And isn't it great that you can disagree with some of my points and I can disagree (laughs) with some of yours? You just said something here, which is my closing Mm -hmm. thought. My remedy to all of this is let's start from where we Mm -hmm. are and let's lead with similarity. So right now, our definition of diversity is the collective mix of differences and similarities. If we lead with similarities, if you first find out what you have in common with those white women that you work with, now the differences don't matter so much because you begin by saying, here's what we have in common. And so now we have a basis for a good, solid relationship to be productive and comfortable with each other. And all of these little nits and pits that we talk about in terms of our differences, they're still there. I'm intellectually curious. I want to know about them. Some people are not intellectually curious and they don't want to know about them. But when now we have a basis for the relationship and those differences don't matter nearly as much as we try to make them. So that's my closing salvo is let's focus on what we have in common in human connections. And we'll make much more progress than trying to get people to see our point of view just because we want to be right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. James O. Rogers. We truly appreciate it. You don't mean it. No, you know. I do mean it. Oh, I'm not passive aggressive in any, by any shape of the imagination. Like, <laughs> yeah. I'm just pulling the leg. <laughs> no, thank you. I know I'm, I know I'm, hey, I'm a bison. I know I'm controversial <laughs> wherever I talk to you. <laughs> Listen, you are comfortable in your own skin and I completely respect I that. Am. And I appreciate yeah, the conversation. You. And definitely you've given us some, some things that are thought provoking. And yeah, I really appreciate the conversation. And thank you so much for joining us. Good. It's been delightful to talk to you. 